Welcome to another Leadership Live. Apologies for the delays. We're sitting here in our studio and invariably crap <laughs> happens and we just figure out a way to get through it. But welcome to, again, another Leadership Live. I'm excited about today. We haven't done one of these in a quarter and we'll be doing another one in August. I'll get to, I'll get to that at the end. But I've got two special guests with me today with John David and Ani. Thank you for both being here. And before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. We've got a lot of questions that were submitted prior to the event, because this is a hot topic around burnout, disengagement. We've talked about it. I've talked a lot about it online. So we've got a number of questions that have already been submitted. However, if you're watching this, it's streaming on most stations at this particular point, and you have an additional question, don't do it on Zoom or st where it's streaming. Send me a text at 734 837 8500. It's just too hard to monitor all the different channels that it may go out on. Again, 734 837 8500. All right, before we get started, I'd like the two of you to introduce yourselves. Ani, you to my right. So please introduce yourself to, so the audience knows who you are. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. I'm Ani McNeil, and I work for Trinity Health. That's a Catholic healthcare organization across the United States. Um, and I serve as the uh, Senior Vice President of Human Resources. Morning, Ani. Morning, Steve. Thank you for having me. My name is John Gardner, John David Gardner, if my mother's watching. Um, hi, Mom. I'm an attorney with the Bodman Law Firm, uh, specializing in workplace employment law. And how long have you been an attorney? Uh, 15 years, Steve. And how long have you been with Trinity? 17 years. Yeah, you've been there a long time, a long from, time. from our conversation. I, I thought, who better to talk to about this idea of burnout than an attorney, for a reason, and a head of HR, for a reason? Because this is serious. Yeah. At least some people think so. And other people think it's a bunch of crap. So we're going to talk about both sides of the coin on this. But before I get going, I wanted to name off a couple of stats that maybe we, you guys have seen, maybe you haven't, but I pulled this from this morning. And just to kind of set the stage for this whole thing around burnout, disengagement, as, as we, we labeled it, no matter what you call it, it it's tough. All right. 89% of workers have experienced burnout in the past 12 months. Seems okay. 77% of employees have experienced feeling of burnout at their current job, because the eight, part of the 89% jump jobs as a result of the burnout. 64% of employees say that they're stressed at work right now. I pulled that from this morning and it was something that was posted yesterday. 21% of workers say that their company does not offer programs to alleviate burnout. That's an interesting comment because one of the questions is why should they? I'll come back to that. It was 20%? 21. And 69% of employees are experiencing burnout while working from home. Hmm, <laughs> makes you think. So let's let's kind of start with how do you guys define burnout, this whole thing that's going on? How do you look at it? Ani, I'm gonna start with you. I look at it as something that is chronic. It's a you know chronically stressed or chronically um, burnt out, I guess, emotionally exhausted, but it's a, it's a chronic situation. What do you think? I think a lot of things. Um, to me, it's a, it's a matter of engagement. Um, and what I think is really apropos to most employers is losing your, your top talent, your thought leaders, your rock stars. Yeah. Um, I think those are the folks who ultimately make it important to all employers um, to, to tune into this issue. Well, we know it's being attributed to turnover. It's being attributed to a whole quiet quitting, you know, to all the buzzwords that are out there right now. Is it really that big of a deal? From your opinion, this is this is entirely from your point of view and what you're experiencing or what you're seeing. Is it that big of a deal, honey? You know, in healthcare, it was a big deal before the pandemic, and you know, during the pandemic and now, you know, three years, um, it's even a bigger deal. Deal. I mean, we're seeing one in three nurses being burnt out, and that's just a study that took place from Duke University. Um, we are sensing it with our staff. Um, and it's interesting that you quoted the, the stat in regards to people that are working at home yeah. as well, because we're hearing from those colleagues that there isn't a turnoff point. Um, you know, their computer, wherever they have it set up in their house, they continue to go back to it and just do one more email or one more, you know, paper. Um, so, you know, it, we are sensing that it is an issue and, and we are doing something about it. We'll get to that in a second. I, wanted, mm -hmm. I do want to hear what you guys are doing about it. 
What do you think, John? It is. I'm uh, hypothetically here from the future because in the future for employers, this issue arises in a number of ways. One is a stress or uh, exhaustion related leave request yeah. under the ADA or the FMLA. Mm -hmm. Another is uh, quiet quitting or uh, you know voicing opinions with, with people's feet. Uh, secession planning uh, doesn't work if you don't have the talent that you're relying on. We're in a, a unique period of time where we're effectively zero unemployment. Uh, so I think it does, uh, it is real, and I think it affects employers in different ways. Yeah. Can I go down that legal path here for a second? Because that was a number of the questions that I received. Here's one in particular, and I don't know who this person is, but there's a website or a group called Expert HR, and there's a legal editor by the name of Robert Teachout. Does that sound familiar at all? Yes. Okay. This is what he said. Anxiety would qualify as a serious health condition under FMLA and, regula and its regulations if an employee requires inpatient care or continuing treatment by a health care provider. This is what he explained. Anxiety or other mental conditions can qualify as a disability under the ADA if it substantially limits one or more of the employee's life activities. What does this mean for our organization? That's from a, somebody named Shelby. Sure, so a number of things to, to unwrap there, but um, without getting too far into the weeds in terms of, of FMLA coverage for an employer of 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius, 12 weeks leave, you always assume coverage, right? There are a few uh, exceptions um, in terms of a disability qualifying, but anxiety uh, does, um, stress does, um, other offshoots, um, depression does, and so, whether you're small, medium, or large, you're gonna be covered uh, based on the employee threshold by at least the ADA, 15 plus employees, right? So most all of your audience. Uh, the FMLA, maybe, maybe not. But at a minimum, you're gonna to have to evaluate requests for leave. And so let's quickly kind of put to the side, maybe it's just a matter of Michigan paid medical or unpaid leave, right? And maybe it's only a duration of uh, a week, two weeks, uh, three weeks. There's a disruption to your productivity if you start to lose folks to stress, depression, yeah. anxiety-related yeah. leave. And so my, my attempt at humor, which is always uh, a little bit of a mixed bag, <laughs> in the future, this issue, when it comes to my desk or, or your desk, um, is at a point where you, you can't unwind it as quickly as you'd like to. And so now I think is the time to, to try to proactively address burnout uh, before you come to that point in, in the future, right? Can, and, can I play devil's advocate on that just for a second? How, how do you know that the anxiety was created by burnout in the workplace? Could that be overstated? Let's assume it is. Um, I mean, in today's era, right, uh, in, in terms of uh, oversharing or at least uh, sharing in real time, everyone's job looks better on, you know, multiple social media <laughs> platforms, right? Uh, today, I'm, I'm in studio, right? So everybody wants to be me today. Sure. Tomorrow, I want to be Steve, wherever Steve is. And on Saturday, I want to be Ani. So you start to already evaluate your job based on what everybody else is doing, just like your vacations, just like your, sure. your social media. I think the real issue though for burnout is we're not armchair physicians or psychologists. And so when it, when it becomes an issue, you have to assume coverage and then you have to engage in the interactive dialogue, right? And you need to address, do we need to look at a reduction in hours? Do we need to look at uh, an a unpaid leave? Do we need to uh, look at a, a furlough? Do we need to look at reassignment of priorities? Do we need to look at additional um, remote work if, if applicable? I'm not saying you can entirely avoid that, but I think there are some measures that employers can take now uh, to best best address that in real time. And if it hasn't cropped up yet, it's going to. And I think to Ani's point, this issue goes back before the pandemic. Right. So let's talk about what you're doing to address it. But I do wanna come back because there were so many questions about what's really causing the burnout. But let's, let's first talk about what are you guys doing, Ani? Because you seem to believe that this is something that's true, both of you do. That I'm not saying I don't. I just I got to play the middle, the neutral card here, right? Because I got I got to comments on both sides. What are you doing? What are what is the org, Trinity doing to deal with this idea of burnout, disengagement, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, we're doing I mean, many things, and there isn't just one thing that you can do to address the issue. And it's different for every person. Yeah. Every person has a different level or threshold of what they might call burnout or emotional exhaustion. Um, you know, in, in my personal opinion, the one thing that you start to do, and, and we've done this and we're continuing to do it, is look at the environment, right? So look at the environment in which the person or people are working. And is there a community of trust? Um, can I come to work being my authentic self? 
Um, and it starts there. Do I have a leader who I feel can support the needs I have? And as John was saying, if it is a matter of maybe workload burden, right? I have too much to do. I keep getting more and more and more and there isn't a resource to help support me. What is the leader doing to support that person manage through this situation? Um, and, you know, a feeling of fairness. When situations come up, are we are we looking at the situation from a fair perspective? So, uh, you know, in Trinity, we evaluated all of our practices, our policies um, to make sure that they were fair, they were um, representative of the, the colleague base that we have and, and even the patients in the communities that we serve. Um, because we know burnout, you know, so oftentimes we think, you know, Steve, you go figure out your burnout, it's all you. Mm -hmm. But burnout, it's it's we, right? It's how we are working it and managing it together. So looking at the environment, um, looking at job design and process, um, enabling technology to help support our colleagues, maybe not to replace everything a, a colleague is doing, but looking at technology as enabler. Um, and then, you know, we've stepped out of the traditional employee assistance program. Um, you and that a couple weeks ago when we yes, were talking. Yes, yeah, and we've moved into more of a um, mental well-being. So we have a colleague care program that is sponsored by our mission integration team and supported, you know, by HR in large part. Um, but there's, we recognize that for a person, for me, if I'm experiencing burnout, um, that it could be contributed based on my home life, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. based on my work life. So the pro, you know, the services that we offer programs are not just for me as an employee, but also for my dependents that might need it. A college, you know, if I have a college student that's going through issues and it's contributing to me, it's also an offering for, you know, our employees' dependents. You, you had mentioned something earlier as you were just talking about the workload. And, and I want to go back to that here for a second because one of the one of the comments, somebody named Stephen, that it's not me, it's spelled differently, <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> sure. Submitted his own question. <laughs> no, it's spelled differently. So here, here's what he says. Our organization talks about burnout all the time. My boss told all of us as leaders to evenly distribute the workload so it's the same for all workers of a certain type. When we did that, it blew up because some naturally want more work than, and others want to just get by. Is this really the right approach? I mean, think about that from the context of burnout. How do you determine what's the right workload given that I thrive with, with an incredibly high workload and I know you do and, and John, I don't know you well enough, but my assumption is you probably thrive in that too, yes. but not everybody does. So yeah. you have two people in the same role how do you have different expectations where this person gets burned out easier? Let's assume that it's it's a it's a yeah. force of the workload itself. We're just making that assumption. How do you deal with that, both from a rest of the team perspective and from a legal perspective, where same position, same responsibilities? Doesn't the expectation have to be the same? Start with you, honey. Uh, no, I don't think the expectation should be the same. And you know, that leader. So Steve's question. Um, as a leader myself, you get to know your people. John mentioned, you know, talent and making sure that you understand the talent that you have and, you know, what is their sweet spot? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And, and you balance the work largely based on that, if you can. I mean, some, some functions may not have that luxury, but in large part, if you know your team and you're, in, you know, engaging with them, you know where they're strengths are, what you can give somebody, what you might not be able to give another person. So the workload may not always be equal. It should be fair, but it, it doesn't always have to be equal in terms of I'm gonna give you 10 papers and 10 papers and 10 papers. I might give you 15 and John 10. You know, um, So I would say the leader should know their team and understand you know, what their capacity is and perhaps even work on increasing that capacity through some development opportunities. Well, what if they're in the same role, John? They're in the exact same role, and now you've got preferential treatment claims, you've got all kinds of other stuff. <laughs> what happens from a legal perspective? And I, I agree with you, Ani, but let's just think about what, what does it per potentially perpetuate? It has to be individualized, or I think it ought to be individualized. Okay. And there's kind of small, medium, and large steps that you can take um, more generally. And I think sometimes employers uh, are surprised um, that uh, the laws are structured in a way that in some senses are employer-friendly, right? So 
to the extent that you have uh, exempt or non-exempt workers, so long as you're paying them for all work uh, on, the, on the non-exempt basis, you can work them un, you know, unlimited overtime, every hour of the day. You don't have to pay holidays, you don't have to offer vacation other than uh, paid medical leave here in Michigan. Right. Good luck staffing if that's your approach, <laughs> but <laughs> there, there are a that. number of things that employers in general can do, but I think specifically to workload, um, what I think makes sense is to try and tailor it to the individual and incentivize it. And I think some of the issue with burnout is what appeals to some doesn't appeal to all. Mm. And so, you know, small steps, honoring vacations, honoring out of office messages, um, seeking to, to work with employees, open air meetings, walking, you know, uh, meetings, my uh, movie reference here is Office Space and the mm -hmm. TPS report, you know, the 1999 uh, fictional movie, but with some real life uh, application where the call was to come in on the weekend to do the TPS reports. Was that really necessary, right? Is that really necessary that Saturday to do that report for that individual? And let's assume again, if, if this is a thought leader, current or emerging talent, is that someone that you want to continue to overwork? Um, if the individual wants additional work, how do we incentivize it, right? Because that doesn't get into discrimination or disparate impact. Um, if you're allowing opportunities equally, uh, not uh, basing it on age, any protected class membership right. or characteristic, that is the individual's uh, choice, right? So additional hours for me may work for my family and myself. Um, additional hours for a colleague, may not work for them. maybe who you know is a stay at home well, or the, the providing a parent, it may not work right now. Um, but I think those are, it all to me is, it encompasses the idea of communicating uh, yes. with the individual. What are you seeing other, you were talking about some of the bigger things that you're doing at Trinity. What are you seeing, and this is for both of you, mm -hmm other mid-sized or smaller organizations, if you have seen that, what are they doing to combat this idea of burnout? Because you've got some flex being a big organization like Trinity to be able to offer some of these enhancements because you're not doing the traditional stuff any longer. Are you seeing anything different that a, a mid-sized, a small organization can actually do that doesn't cost them an arm and a leg? You know, what I even see within our hospitals or our medical groups um, outside of like the traditional programs that fall into your benefit plans is just recognition time. You know, taking a break during the day and like you said, John, going outside and, and going for a walk or having a, you know, an outside picnic or, you know, meeting with your team, just stepping out of that normal environment um, and getting together. And, you know, for a nurse or for a physician, that might be a little bit more challenging because their work is at the bedside. Yeah, and inside. so how do you bring celebrations or respite moments um, to them? So some of our, you know, locations have even created respite rooms or wellness break rooms where they can go in and there's a yoga ball or there's a, you know, refrigerator with like water or snacks and coloring books. You know, they can just take a break while they're walking past the room. Um, so it's non-traditional type of stuff. And, and I'm, you know, other companies, even outside of healthcare, um, I'm, I'm reading and, and watching that that's what they're doing as well. So whenever they can have team collaboration, sure. you know, Johnny mentioned mm -hmm. communication. I think that is essential, you know, today, especially post pandemic, people feeling Great. like connected and heard. So you mentioned yoga. Yes. And I smiled. And you and it, did. Was, it had nothing to <laughs> do with disrespect for yoga. It was, <laughs> it was only because the second question that I got was um, according to a recent McKenzie, McKenzie study, an employer can't yoga their way out of the challenges of toxic behavior that is the real cause for most burnout and disengagement. Okay, that was the comment. We keep pushing wellness programs. Why are we afraid? And you kind of did already, Anya, but I want to, let's kind of hear this person out. Her name is Terry. Um, why are we afraid to address the real problem in most organizations? Retrain or fire the offenders and burnout goes away. Prove me wrong. Pretty direct from yeah. Terry. <laughs> I don't disagree. I don't disagree with Terry. And I would say that as employers, we are. You know, we recognize even within our organization that management or lack of management support in, in some cases even toxic behavior from mm. leaders is a contributing or the contributing factor on that unit. You can see it in your metrics if you're watching them. Um, and so how we respond and what we do, people are watching. Um, and you know, John can even share, we, we have to walk through a process, but we must address it. And so some employers may be a little bit slower to address it. We've been slower to address it on some occasions, but it's not lost on us. 
I don't disagree with, with Terry's uh, question. You hear that, Terry? <laughs> you got, you've got two agreements. I happen to agree with it as well, so you got three agreements. But John, please, continue. <laughs> Slash statement, and I don't disagree with anything that Ani said. Um, I would turn it a little bit on its head, though, and in, in ask it in a somewhat rhetorical way. And that is to say, if... If the individual, right, if the talented person, uh, right, is getting more work, right, that's their reward is more work and maybe more more money. Is that really the example you want to set for staff, right? Is that in in five, seven years, do you want to be getting more hours and more dollars or do you want other things? That would be one one thought. But to the management point of Terry's question, what I would say is it is so easy as employees uh, and, and employers to, to go the easier route, which is to give the work to the thought leader and the emerging talent, right? The rock star is just gonna do it, right? Versus going to the person who always has some reason why they can't get it on time, they, they, they're stressed, they're overworked, they're overwhelmed. That, yes, that is a management issue, but it's also a, a, a talent uh, a, a, and productivity issue. You, you have to address the, the cause, not just the effect. And it can be on both sides. Uh, and, and I think employee. that's what Terry's referring to. And then uh, there was somebody who sent me something but preferred not to give their name. So let me, because they're related, if I can just read this one and then comment on it. Burnout is real, but are we solving the wrong problems? Kind of what you were just talking about. Our company provides meditation rooms, which is fine, but we're not solving the real issue or the real problem. The problem is that our leaders are always changing the goalposts without telling us. Expectations are constantly changing. Somebody out there is watching this and saying, I'm feeling this pain right now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, expectations are constantly changing. No one knows what's expected of them. Sure, I will take a nap in the room a few times a week, which is probably why they're not giving me their name. Uh, but that's not solving the problem. Why aren't we dealing with the real issue of inept leaders? It sounds like there's a lot of blame being put on the leaders to cause the burnout. Yeah, and I would say I'm not, I don't entirely agree with putting all the blame directly on the leaders. I do recognize that there are some leaders that are equally perhaps burnt out or disconnected from work, and that should be addressed separately. I think that there's a, a breakdown in communication. I know within our leadership structure, our you know CEO at the, the very top of the chain is having um, communications frequently with all colleagues, recorded videos and making sure that messages post board meetings or you know other meetings that he's having, that colleagues are hearing the message, whether it is hybrid work and how we're managing it or you know uh, transitioning from being more technology enabled or advocacy work communication is filtering down but where i think there's a breakdown is that our middle managers we continue to give them more and more and more um, and oftentimes um, we don't do a good enough job of explaining why something has mm. to change or why we are implementing something or why we have an initiative. We do a lot of that why and discernment at you know, many levels above the middle manager level, but then we just expect the manager Roll to, and change yeah, and here's, do it. here's a memo, here's a five yeah. slide PowerPoint, now go explain it to your staff and we're not giving them meaningful time to really understand or absorb. So it's it's no wonder why our colleagues feel that it's the manager, but I think in some to some degree as executives we take we also take accountability, but it's we expect communication to be cascaded and feedback to be provided as well. Can, can I use myself as a really poor yeah. example of what you just described because I did what you just described not long ago. So Change I thought was easy for, it's not easy for everybody, no. right? I am I love change, so you tell me to change and it's like, okay, let's try it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Well, we were, we were paying some dollars for a project management tool that we use at, at our organization, but we also pay for it through our Office 365. Microsoft comes with Planner, yeah. which has a lot of the same tools. I'm like, why the heck are we paying for it? Here's the deal, we're changing, just get it done. Talk about the stress that, that I create. To me, it was like nothing. It was, we talked about the why at a different level. We wanted to save some dollars. We wanted to reinvest it in other places. And then I went to my marketing team, part of which are here. And I said, we're just gonna change. And the, 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 the consternation I got back, I probably caused some burnout for about two weeks because I didn't even think through communicating the change on it. I think that's a real issue that's causing some of what's going on, especially the changes that all organizations or many organizations are making because of the financial circumstances going on in the economy right now. We're just 
haphazardly making the change. It seems haphazardly, but it's the communication that is really haphazard of some of that change. Is that does that follow what you're saying? It is, yeah, directly. And you know, you can't, you don't know all the unintended consequences, right. but you should pause to understand the major ones. Um, and of course, when you roll out the change, you hear from majority of your team and you're like, oh my God, this was the worst decision ever. <laughs> or had I just done X, Y, Z, it could have been, you know, better understood. I, I probably should have let them weigh in on it. And... <laughs> Duh. <laughs> yeah. but lesson anyway, learned. Lesson learned. Well, and that's, I think that's a great example. I think sometimes for, for managers, um, the, 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 the initial thought is I'm going to meet with the individual, right? I'm going to calendar something. I'm going to ask how things are going. Um, maybe I'm going to ask them, this is a, an example of, of a similar situation which uh, ended poorly, but it was a good lesson learning. I'm going to ask the individual who's uh, indicating being overstressed to, to monitor everything they do in a day or a week, right? And then we'll kind of evaluate how productive they are or where we can find ways. To someone who's experiencing stress, anxiety, uh, burnout, that you're just adding work to their, their situation, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of times, um, maybe a better approach is a more frequent uh, review or a simplified review. Don't throw surveys at it necessarily. Surveys are great, but it just creates more work or committees, right? Death by committee. Instead, maybe look specifically at where, what are areas that you are doing well in? What are areas that we are doing well in? What are areas that we can improve upon? Yeah. And what, not in, three years, what in three months would you like to see um, in, in your role, right? Maybe it's upskilling, up training. Maybe it's a, um, a hybrid remote work uh, Wednesday or Monday or Friday, whatever the situation, if, if applicable. Obviously, healthcare is very different and unique. In terms, you know, you're not gonna have frontline and providers. Can't have a remote right. nurse, no. at least Tele not yet. Telemedicine, <laughs> we're just not, we're not there yet. So, uh, but asking the individual, you know, kind of what, what he or she suggests, um, providing an opportunity to be heard, but not not adding additional work um, to try and figure out where they're being overworked. And, and it's a it's a moving target. It, it is it's it, it has to be. Yeah. You know. One question I always ask too. So all the questions you asked are spot on. Is what do you need to do your best work? What mm -hmm. is is there something you need from me that I'm not providing you um, that you need? And it's different for every employee that you ask. And, and we you know? call them different things, stay interviews stay, yeah. or exit interviews. Yeah. Right. Or, but right. maybe it's just, a, and it's different for different employers, maybe it's literally walking into the person's office, uh, picking up the phone or, or putting something on a calendar with the idea being, here's here's what we are, are seeking. And, and maybe the response is, I'm, I'm good, right? Um, but I think to one of the statistics Steve mentioned in the beginning, those folks, 70, 69% who are working remotely, who are feeling- 69%. Yeah. 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 Those same folks, and it, it hits some generational um, uh, right. specificities, those same folks want to work remote, and yet they feel overwhelmed with remote work, right? And so that's, it's the push-pull. Do you bring them in? <laughs> Do you try and you know, connect them? Do you try and network? Do you have a mentorship program? Um, it, but a lot of times people are sending mixed messages. I want to work remote, but I'm, I'm stressed out in my, my work well, environment. And that was one of, the, right. one of the articles that somebody, I, di I didn't bring the article, but they linked to the article, and it was exactly that issue, that I'm gonna reduce my stress by working at home, Right, because we we proved under the last couple of years that we can work at home. It cut off all kinds of drive time and everything else. And then in the same article, the same people were saying, but I don't know how to shut off. So I'm working even more hours. It was easier when I was in the office, but I want to stay home. Like what, how do you fix that if that's the cause of the burnout that's going on where uh, out of one side of my mouth, I'm saying one thing, as you just said, John, and on the other side of my mouth, I'm saying the exact opposite. Right. What do you do with that type of person? Because it's happening. I, I like, this is my second <laughs> attempt at a movie reference. The, the storyboard framework, right, um, and, and a lot of films, uh, I'll just think of a couple here, Star Wars, uh, The Hunger Games, Rocky, right? The, the storyboard framework is there's a mentor um, and there's a hero, right? Yeah. And you kind of, Yoda finds Luke, Hamish finds Katniss, Mickey finds Rocky, right? You, we, as managers. Can you just list, you miss some of the millennials. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I, so I'm trying, I'm trying. trying. <laughs> I'll, I'll think of something, I'll think of something. <laughs> we, as employers and managers, we don't wanna be, and we shouldn't strive to be Luke, Katniss, and Rocky. We wanna be Yoda, Amish, and Mickey, right? We wanna empower 
our our employees to be the heroes in their own work yeah. story. It, we call it work for a reason. It is work. It is. Everyone is burnt out, right? Depending on, and I'm not minimizing, but everyone can can be burnt out, right? And so trying to have work-life balance, do it day by day, week by week, right? I, I'm Maybe today is not gonna be the time that I get to spend countless hours with my kids. Maybe it is, but try and get the balance uh, over right. time and try and make the employee recognize and realize what are you aspiring to 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 do and become, right? And and ideally, it's here with us because again, um, in the future or at least now, very very difficult to find replacement employment or talent rather, and and it's difficult to keep throwing money at the the situation, right? That is okay. not advice that my clients want, particularly um, based on locale, right? Uh, right. UP clients don't want to be told just offer them more money. There, there aren't people here, right? We, right. We, right? we need we need to motivate and incentivize and work with. Uh, making these employees the heroes in their own work story. Yes. And I think you said, I mean, key point you said, it is work. I mean, we all have a choice. There's and a book. It's called Work for a Reason. Work for a Reason. <laughs> there is a book. Yeah. And, and so you have to work. And I think you people have to examine if they have this chronic burnout that I'd mentioned. Um, is, it, is there a, a misfit between what they've chosen to do as work you know, and their, you know, their alignment, like their their joy of practice and whatever that practice area is. If I go in every day and I just feel like, oh, you know, it's a burden to be at work, then I need to reevaluate whether this is the right work for me, right? But I, I have to work. Is this the right work? Um, and I think people get confused between like burnout and stress because I, mm. you know, I thrive on a good amount of stress. Like when I'm when I don't have a full day. I'm like, why don't I have a full day? Exactly. It's right? almost boring for you, <laughs> exactly. right? Right. And then, yeah. and then when it pours, you kind of wonder. Man, when I, it pours, you're just I, like, too much. okay, but today's better than yesterday, yeah. and tomorrow, you know. Um, but you know, I, I think of like when people are truly burnt out, because there are there are people that are tr truly burnt out to your um, facts. Yeah, but yeah. you know, it's there's I call it pebbles in your shoes. Like there's pebbles in your shoes. At every step you take, it hurts and it's every day or every hour. And so what are we as employers doing to address those pebbles in, in our colleagues' shoes? It's, you told me that there's an issue with the linen not fitting the bed. Am I helping you with making sure we have fitted sheets for the bed, you know, or whatever it is in your workplace? And that to me is when it's repetitive and they don't have the means to do their work, it becomes, you know, an, a, a chronic issue. Could. Could some of this also, and I, I agree with everything, but but it's I'm, a, I'm my job is to play devil's advocate. I was gonna walk out when you said you agree with everything. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna play devil's advocate, okay? And it's there's there's kind of two things. You said the term balance, mm -hmm. and I want to reference that here in a second, and then I want to go to the, uh, Jeff. Is it possible that much of this talk about burnout and disengagement is caused by the hype the media has given it? People almost expect to be burned out. Now let me take mm -hmm. take it back to your comment around balance. Is teaching balance, talking about balance, actually the right thing to be teaching? I, I've talked about small, medium, large approaches before. I, I would go to a medium approach answer, which is sometimes it's scheduling, it's prioritization, it's asking you know the manager uh, in, in an employee manager situation, when do you need this by? Um, I have seven assignments. Can mm -hmm. you um, order them for me? Right. Some of it is 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 balance in a different way. Some of it can be addressed simply by, I think, um, more specifics around, I've got, you know, X number of meetings this week. Uh, what what are the priorities for this week or this day? I flip, flip, flip. I was kind of coming at it from the employer's, yeah. Con, yeah. the employee's con, uh, discussion, because if somebody keeps telling me, I won't be happy unless I have balance in my work and my personal life. Are we automatically setting them up for failure? Is um, balance the right word? Think about the impact of the term balance. I'm just asking. Yeah, I, I personally, I don't use the word balance because I don't know that you can have a balance between your personal life, your work life, or whatever you choose. It's, you need to, it's individualized, and I think a person has to figure out what that looks like for them at what time of day. So if I choose to, you know, my balance is, for me, between work and life, I, I'm an early riser, so I get up really early in the morning. I'm not gonna wait till 7 a.m. 
to send an email because you only you get up at seven and you don't want to get any emails from me earlier than that. The, what I choose to do is what I choose to do. So that's my balance for me, what works for my life. And I think as a, as a leader, I would not impose my work, life integration or balance on my employee. I would do what you said, which is we have to communicate. I don't know what you need unless you communicate and vice versa, right? Great point, and I think, um, great point, Ani, and, and to, Steve, to your question and point, I think it's a balance over what period of time. I don't think work-life balance is gonna be daily or even weekly. No. I think it is it is measured in quarters or a, a longer view. Um, I do think there are some things, though, that both employees and employers can do, um, and some of them can be very simple. Some of them can simply be, if you have access to the calendar uh, programming that Steve mentioned, Maybe it's looking at the employee's calendar before you say, I'm going to schedule a meeting or I want to schedule a call. Everyone can do that. Even I can do that, right? I can I can see uh, other people's calendars and not make it more work for them to schedule a call to try and help them. Um, I can help you know, with prioritization. Maybe there's some incentives that employers can do. It's, you're already booked in terms of the amount of money you're paying in, in most situations. Mm -hmm. Maybe the incentive is an hour early here or there, or when you when you hit this project, that's it, uh, right, for, for that day or that week, yeah. whatever the interval. You don't necessarily have to, and a lot of employ employers can't continue to throw dollars at it or right. Right, bring in third parties. I think there are some simpler solutions um, that, that may appeal. I, I, I bring up the term balance because I hear this all the time. Of it, What does balance connotate? 50-50. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, you know, so are we setting, by con constantly mm -hmm. saying balance, 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 are we setting people up to think, well, I spend more of my time at work. I'm not 50-50. Now I'm stressed. Is it more of a blend? Mm -hmm. And I know it's semantics, but sometimes the words do have meaning when we keep saying them over and over and over and over. So that's kind of the one, one point. But when I go back to what Jeff had said, is some of this burnout, perceived burnout, not saying it's not real, because there are people that, oh, we feel it, we, right, the stress. Is some of it potentially, because it came up three or four times in this, Perceived burnout because we're told so many times that we should be burned out. That we should be? Yeah. Uh, personally and respectfully for our audience out there, um, I, I feel the, the phrase is overused. Burnout. Burnout. Okay. I think it's okay. overused. I think people can be burned out on eating too much chocolate or burned out, you know, mm -hmm. at work respectfully. Um, so I think it's just, it's describing, again, it's, there's a misfit between what you're doing and what you want to do, like your internal value, your passion. Um, and I, I don't know that you can apply a 50-50 to that. No, I don't think you can, yeah. Uh, and I'll take it once, let me just give you a kind of a scenario. I did a, I did a, a keynote yesterday and I, on the screen, I'm giving away the answer. I hope nobody's watching it who's gonna be in it tomorrow, <laughs> but I'm gonna do this anyways. I basically had two circles, a red circle and, and a blue circle on the screen. And it looks like they're the exact same size. And I told the audience, they're not the exact same size. So how many of you think the blue circle is bigger than the red circle? And how many of you think the red circle is bigger than the blue? And I got about 80% of the audience to pick one over the other one. Do you think they were the same size? Yes. The fact is they were. And my point in all that is, and I think this goes to kind of Jeff's question that we've got to be mm -hmm. careful about is, if we keep repeating the same thing over and over and over, it becomes our reality. And if I keep hearing it, if you, if you tell the kid from the time that they're a little kid, the blue circle is always going to be bigger than the red circle, instinctually we know that's not the case, but because we were told so many times it's part of our reality, and if we convince enough people it becomes part of our culture, could some of that be what's going on? Not all of it, because I, I do believe that we overwork, we don't communicate, we do all those things. Could that be some of it, given the impact media and all of this has on the way we think? Sure. Um, I would say. But I think some things, and I think we all probably have experienced this, some are examples of maybe the culture, right, and this mm -hmm. um, is fairly specific, maybe the culture is those people who are hardworking show up on Saturdays, right? They're talking about um, uh, salary exempt employees. Maybe for folks that are experiencing burnout, right, if they can get the work done in a truncated period, what's the point of just showing up on Saturday, right? It's the same increment of work. It's just different hours. It's right. it's 6 a.m., maybe it's 6 p.m. Obviously, you need you know, intervals where people are in the same space at the same time. Sure. But I think we can reimagine ways to produce the same uh, measure of outcome. And it doesn't have to be 
nine to five in the office in suits Saturdays, so everyone knows you know how mm -hmm. dedicated you are, right? That that to me is a recipe for disaster. And sometimes you have to change just to stay the same in terms of your level of productivity. Well, let me flip that on you because you're an attorney. Yeah. Billable hours. Yep. You can't do that. It's not based on outcomes. It's based upon your billable hours. Exactly right. <laughs> But when I, when I get my hours in, yeah. it's up to me, right? Okay. And so the incentive for, to me and the message to those uh, up and coming, uh, you know, uh, associates and, and emerging talent is it, it doesn't matter necessarily how you get there as long as you get there okay. for you and for us, sure. right? And so it, obviously coming in the office, if you don't have the experience, is important. Getting to meetings, getting to court, getting that experience. And, and that will help you. But certainly the hours are important, but when you do them, maybe less important. And so this idea that you have to come in on Saturday to a lot of folks or Sunday or, you know, work. If, if you're, you know, if your office lights off at uh, 6 yeah, p.m., you're, yeah. you're a slacker. No, I think that needs to be changed. And I think that's on management. Right. right I think right. then we're we're part of uh, we're part of a real problem. Yeah. Flip gears a little bit, because I just got a text about it and then I had a, a comment about it as well. So as, as employers, as leadership, as HR, as, as whatever advice that you're giving to folks, trends to look for to see if your team is experiencing burnout, real burnout. What should we be looking for? What data should we be looking at? Aside from somebody just coming up and saying, hey, I'm burned out, I'm disengaged and so on, because now it's gotten too far potentially. What do you look for? It's a good good question. You know, what I look for is if there is a change over a period of time, so not just in one day or one week, but if there is a change over a, a period of time um, in that person's motivation or um, interest in, in, you know, picking up an assignment or asking a question, it may not necessarily be an indication of burnout, but it's going to be an indication that something is happening with that person. Something has changed. Maybe it's something in their personal life that is contributing. Maybe it's something in their work life that's contributing. But I feel as a leader, I have an obligation to check in. I don't need to probe. I don't need anything personal, but I have an obligation to say, and I did this last week with one of my colleagues to say, I've been noticing that you have been showing up differently. Let me give mm. you three examples of what I mean. And it may be nothing. It might just be my observations, I, false pick, you know, picking up on something. But I want to I want to just check in with you to see if there's anything that you need from me that you're not receiving. Um, and quite in that conversation led to the person feeling like, you know, decisions are being made without collaboration on many mm -hmm. levels. And, you know, um, organizations that are large and integrated, it, it, that may happen, it right? Will. Yeah. Um, but it's how we describe them. So I think just staying, um, kind of keeping a pulse. And if you know your people, you'll, you'll see differences in their behavior. Um, because of the size of the, your organization in particular, are there other kind of numerical trends that you also look at? I, I agree with the one-on-one, -on -one, and mm -hmm. for as many of us that are able to do that, we should be paying attention to our teams and the people that we work with and so on. But are there actually more kind of documented trends that you would say, if, if this is happening, you might want to pay attention because you may be experiencing some burnout on your team? I mean, certainly turnover is kind of on of course, the back end. Of that's yes. the number one. Um, yes. One yes. of the easiest, you know, low-hanging fruits is if you've had a position posted in a group for, I would say, beyond uh, 90 days, um, that's probably a little bit artificially low. Clearly, if you're posting that position, you recognize that there is a need for, mm -hmm. for more workers in that group. And so you can't ask people to continue to triage without any end, right? right? So maybe you need to mm -hmm. reassign or delegate work. Maybe you need to bring in... Um, short-term staff or temporary staff. Um, remember, you know, Yoda helped Luke. There's always that. There's always that time. Or Hamish helped Katniss. There's always that time where you hit a low point, and that's. It's important that you help in the low point before you know. Otherwise, you know, it's it's two different paths, and yeah. um, you don't want your talent to pick the path of uh, least resistance, which is the door. Mm -hmm. um, that that is not a solution. Uh, that is. Yeah. You know. I um I read every exit interview that comes through oh, and um, our group. So we review them, you know, for the, for what we call our, our Trinity Health Nation. And, you know, we look at them every week okay. and it's very interesting to read what our colleagues are telling us. And I think if as leaders, we pay close attention to how that person may change over a short period of time, it's, 
it's like the subtle things and a lot, and for them, it's the most important thing. You know, like I referenced the pebble and the rocks. It's the, I don't have what I need to get my work done or I, there's somebody on the work unit that is not cooperating with me. There isn't communication, cooperation. It's difficult for me to do my job. I've shared it with you, maybe not directly, but you haven't done anything about it. And so I'm going to leave now. So that is, and, and we don't want people to leave, right? We want people to stay. We want to work through the situation. And, you know, we're focused on retention recovery um, right now. So, but again, a lot is now on the shoulders of the middle manager yeah. um, to recognize issues, to resolve issues. And this is where, from an executive leadership standpoint, we do leadership rounding to help supplement that for the, you know, the middle manager. What, what about also looking at things like excess sick time taken in an apartment all of a sudden? Yes. You know, those indicators potentially of this burnout thing that's going on, and it could be by department, it could be by, by leader. Are there other kind of indicators mm-hmm. like that that you could think of that are something that people watching this would say, oh yeah, I, you know, I can look at that, and it, it might help. Yeah, and it's even not taking time off. Or not right? taking time you know, off. So right. we see not taking yeah. time off okay. and, or taking you know a pattern of time off. Um, we even measure productivity, so overstaffed and understaffed. Mm. Um, and so there's a, a measurement that we get reported on every two weeks. There's a, a number that comes out. And you know departments that are understaffed that have you know greater than 100% productivity you need to question mm-hmm. why are we at 125 in this department what are the contributing factors so we have a mechanism for leaders you know to discern that information and what needs to happen you know and if it's a pattern over time we expect them to address it the other thing that i look at and i even look at this in my own organization if you ask your team a question and nobody answers yes <laughs> There's a problem. That happens to you too? No. It happens to <laughs> And I know this and yeah. we, t- we, we teach this, but invariably it happens, right? It does. And I think it happens in every organization. It's the degree in which it happens. But if, if people aren't feeling like they can say anything, like their opinion will be heard, I think that's a direct contributor to burnout for some folks. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Right. Again, it's that relationship with, with the leader or leaders. Yeah. Or even think, the team, right? Yeah. Psychological safety mm-hmm. is, am I safe? Do I feel safe to speak up? in the room, you know, with my peers and my leader. Yeah, to set it up, maybe to, to be bold enough to change the format so that everyone's being heard. Um, and I would, yes, productivity, uh, metrics, attendance, um, unused vacation or PTO. One of the things that I, I'm full of analogies, but um, it's like running a marathon. It's like building a financial, um, you know, nest. It's, um, it's planning, right? It is very difficult to say to someone, go run 26.2 miles, mm-hmm. right? It is a lot easier to say, okay, this week we're gonna walk three miles, three times a day, right? And so that's the shorter interval. Because if someone, if the the view ahead is, <laughs> it's right. just more, it's more of the same, it, it is difficult mm-hmm. um, to, to motivate and inspire someone. Uh, yeah. And that's, I think that's where we as managers, we as employers um, can, can help our employees uh, and, and lift them up, right? And uh, I go to one of Steve's, uh, hopefully I'm paraphrasing correctly, the definition of leadership, right, is not to get more out of the person, it's to set the person up to to be the best, the yes. best self, right? Yeah, yes. the term that I often use is it's not just to get the best from, it's actually to get the best for. for exactly. So you create an environment where people choose to give their best exactly. because you can't force performance mm-hmm. any for any long period not of time. Not for long. You yeah. can do it for about a day. Yep. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're trying it all over again, so that doesn't work. I do have one last question because we're coming up on the hour, though. How much does compensation play into burnout? And the reason I asked the question is, again, I got the question, but I, as I did a little research yesterday and this morning, one of the top things that comes up in terms of how to fix burnout, one of the top five is always increased compensation. What are you, what's your opinion on that? You go first. <laughs> yes, yes and no. The loaded one for the I'm, last question. I'm not, I'm not ducking the question, but I will, I will submit. So, so that's an attorney's response. Come on, come on. I want to qualify. I want to kind of quickly dodge. In my experience, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to find someone who will tell you that they are overcompensated, right? It is amazing to me the self-preservation instinct that kicks in in various circumstances, and individuals always feel that they're undercompensated, underappreciated, mm-hmm. overworked, overwhelmed. 
And I go into meetings with the idea that everyone believes that they should be compensated more, more right? Yeah. And it is always yeah. in the top five. Compensation, benefits, recognition, um, upward mobility, on and on it goes. I think to the compensation point, there is there are ways to incentivize, um, but it doesn't need to be um, base necessarily. It could be productivity. Sure. Uh, it could be pay at risk. It could be you are you know we can't afford to pay uh, a dollar more, but we can afford to give you more flex time or right. uh, opportunities to work remotely or. You know, John loves, you know, Monday morning runs. So, uh, John, you're, you know, Monday morning, you earned it, right? Go out there. And so I, I think the compensation piece is always going to be there, but you have to go into it as an employer, I think, with the mindset that even your lowest producing employee feels that they're undercompensated to begin with. Yeah. So telling yeah. them that, right. well, you got to hit, you know, you got to hit Steve's metrics or Ani's metrics, that, that's not going to work for them. They already feel like they're underpaid and they're right. going to compare it to, the person who's out, you know, uh, drinking wine with their work group, right? That job starts to look really, really nice when you're sitting inside uh, in Q1 and it's, you know, freezing cold. So I don't know if I answered the question, but yeah, I think yeah, you have to go into it with the idea. I that, agree with, with everything that you said. And what I'll add to it is um, it's the number one thing that I hear, you know, compensation from, from our colleagues, from our leaders. If we just increase compensation, it would fix the problem. And in some cases, OK, we, we will. We do but it hasn't fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. So I think compensation is, it, it's not the primary factor, it's a contributing factor, but it's not the primary factor. You have to fix the environment in which the person is working. So somebody who, you know, we, we all get calls, right? There's another job that oh, is, sure. might be better than the job that we're in. If you catch anyone on a weak moment, it's not because that job's paying more, it's something else that's contributing yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think compensation um, in the last two to three years, it it has been probably talked about just as much as burnout, um, but it's not a contributing factor. We should we should be paying a just and fair wage. Yeah, fair. We, sure. we have to we have to all pay fair. One one of the things that we hear from part of our business is, is recruiting, and part, one of the things that we hear all the time is. Uh, the, the reason I want to leave is that the employer, they, they're not paying me enough to put up with all this crap. Yeah. So we, some people freak out and say, oh, we just got to get paid more. Well, what's all the crap that they're having to deal with? And that puts the compensation in the limelight, because if we don't deal with the crap, you do got to pay me more to put up with whatever the environment actually is. That's how I see compensation, assuming that fair comp is there. Yeah, and I think yeah. one quick uh, aside too is total compensation surveys I think are helpful. I, right. I wonder, Annie, if that's not yes. something you've been using for a long time. And to avoid the use of the word um, a, a cost uh, a, a, a cost increase based on inflation or, yeah. a, a, right, a, or across the board increases, because that, that doesn't help, um, mm -hmm. right, if you're calling it just simply, you know, it doesn't help get more groceries if you're just doing a, a wage, right. a cost of living increase. Well, we're out of time. It's, it's a little bit after 12. I know we started a little bit late, but we try to get it done right right on the hour if we can. For all of you that are watching, if you have additional questions or comments on this idea of burnout, because it's an issue I and mean, we've got to deal with it. We've got to talk about it. We've got to figure out some solutions, which I think we got from both of you that, that it doesn't cost millions of dollars to go fix if we apply some of the basic 101 things that, that the two of you talk about. So, so thank you for that. But if you've got additional questions, if, you, if you've got thoughts about this, we can do two things. We have another session coming up August 16th. August 16th. We may go back to monthly because we're being asked to go back to monthly, but for right now it'll be August 16th. We can talk about this subject again because it would be great to get other people's opinions and viewpoints, and, and you guys are welcome to come back in on that as well. Maybe we get a round table of a half a dozen people and like talk through this. So if you want us to do that, send me either a text, send me a message, and we'll bring that on. If you have another topic that you want us to talk about as well, if it makes the cut, please send it, we'll take a look at it, and if it's something that we really need to talk about, we will. The whole idea behind this Leadership Live is to kind of talk freely about our own perspectives on this. It's not always one right perspective. We, we do know that, right? There is a right or a wrong in many things, but in some of this stuff, it's like, there's a ton of different ways to skin the cat. We gotta figure out how to skin the cat and not just keep whining about the cat.
No offense to those of you that love cats. Please don't take that the wrong way. There's gonna be all kinds of hate as a result of that. But John, thank you for making the trip Thanks over here. It was great to get your thoughts on it as, as, as always. Thank you for your input and, and experience that you guys have gone through. This has been another edition of Leadership Live. Again, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys again soon.